السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته which means may the peace, mercy and blessings of God be upon you all. My name is Hamid Zubair and these past few weeks my organization, a safe initiative, has been working closely with the Curtin Christian Union, UWA Christian Union and the Islamic Council of Western Australia in organizing these two interfaith dialogues. A safe initiative, which of course in Arabic means the summer initiative, our goal is to compassionately convey the teachings of Islam, especially in a time where there is much hostility towards Muslims and the religion they follow. So it is a privilege to be standing here today, you know, with two great speakers, Brother Adnan Rashid and Samuel Green, who undoubtedly will do a great job representing their side when it comes to the important issue of is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam foretold in the Bible. Equal recognition should also be given to Stephen Bruce, who is um, the president of the Curtin Christian Union, and he will be our moderator for the evening. Now, before we begin the Quran and Bible recitation, I just briefly want to mention two things. The first concerns the structure of tonight's dialogue. So each speaker will be given 20 minutes for an opening statement. This will then be followed by a first rebuttal of 10 minutes, a second rebuttal of five minutes, a Q&A session lasting 25 minutes where you, the audience, can ask both the speakers whatever questions you may have. And finally, we will conclude, give each speaker three minutes conclusion time. Secondly, and more importantly, tonight is a night where Muslims and Christians can come together and discuss their beliefs in a calm and articulate manner. As such, this applies to everyone in the room, be respectful. So no cheering, no excessive clapping. And to my Muslim brothers and sisters, no takbir tonight, okay? <laughs> With that being said, um, Brother Ibrahim Saeed will get up to recite a brief passage from Surah Al-A'raf. The verses that he will be reciting is at the heart of tonight's dialogue because it is these verses which specifically mention that our Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, is foretold in the Bible. You can follow the translation on the screen. Thank you very much. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem واكتب لنا في هذه الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة إنا هدنا إليك قال عذابي أصيب به من أشاء ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء فسأكتبها للذين يتقون ويؤتون الزكاة والذين هم بآياتنا يؤمنون الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الأمي الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الأمي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم إسرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم فالذين آمنوا به وعزروه ونصروه واتبعوا النور الذي أنزل معه أولئك أولئك هم المفلحون قل يا أيها قل يا أيها الناس إني رسول الله إليكم جميعا الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Declan and I'm a member of the Curtin Christian Union. Um, and tonight I'll be reading from the Torah and the Gospel. Uh, from the Torah, I'll be reading from uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, uh, verses 1 to 4. If a prophet, or one who foretells by dreams, appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. Uh, and from the Gospel, I'll be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, <coughs> verses 23 to 27. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out, or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, I would now like to invite up uh, Zab Zabir Saeed uh, from the Islamic Council of Western Australia to introduce our speakers. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have been asked to be very short and sweet, uh, inshallah, so I will not take too much of your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the two speakers to you tonight, Sheikh Adnan Rashid and Samuel <coughs> Green. Sheikh Adnan is an international lecturer from London who specializes in Muslim history and Islamic numismatics. He attained his bachelor's with honors from Burbank College University of London and completed his master's from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, he is currently pursuing further studies in history at London. He has studied the Hadith sciences and holds Ijaza certificates in that field. He has also debated high profile Christian theologians and appears occasionally on major media outlets, such as the BBC, BBC Asia, <coughs> Network, Islam Channel, ITV, and many more. Adnan has traveled extensively. Uh, he has, uh, uh, Adnan has traveled extensively and has conducted history tours to a number of Islamic monuments. He is an avid book collector and also takes a keen interest in studying ancient medieval coins. He has taught many Islamic as well as history courses, workshops around the globe. Adnan Rashid is currently working on a book on the history of Muslim civilization. He also writes poetry in Urdu and language occasionally and is an admirer of poets like Mir and Iqbal. He speaks fluently in English and Urdu and also feels relatively competent in Arabic. He currently resides with his family in London. On the other hand, Samuel Green became a Christian while at university and has been involved in various Christian ministries since 1999. He has worked with the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students as a campus evangelist and Islamic engagement director. He is also a writer for the Answering Islam website and the Anglican Interfaith Chaplain, engaging with Islam is one of Samuel's main interests, and he does this through writing, training, evangelism, lectures, and debates. He has a degree in theology and chemical engineering. I would like to wish both speakers the best for this debate and hand over to Sheikh Adnan, to, yeah, to Samuel Green to start the debate. Thank you. Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, as Hamid introduced, my name's Stephen and I'll be the moderator for this evening. Um, just as a heads up, first Sam and Adnan will be op uh, presenting their opening presentations um, and now I have 20 minutes for that and when one minute is left, um, I'll sound a little bell, so hopefully they can both hear that one. Um, yes, I'm just going to introduce 
Uh, Sam, is it coming up first to see? Oh, yes. Um, also, just to mention, please turn your phones off after this evening. Uh, and also, you are being video recorded, so uh, don't do anything silly. Cheers. <laughs> So I start the clock with my first word. Well, good evening, and it's uh, a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight to look at this very important question. I want to thank you for coming out and taking seriously the things of God and that the claims that religions actually make. Uh, I want to thank the organisers, the Christian and student groups who have spent a lot of time working with this. Thank you very much. And I want to thank Adnan for coming over. We have debated uh, three times before and I count him as a good friend. And so it's great to see you again. The question tonight is, is Muhammad foretold in the Bible? Now, why are we asking this question? Well, we're asking it because this is what the Quran claims, as we've already seen. Uh, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in the Torah and gospel with them. That is, the Quran claims that Muhammad is foretold in the Torah and the gospel that are with the Christians and Jews. And so throughout Islamic history, right up to the present day, Muslims have come to the Bible to find these references about Muhammad. Uh, and there are many, many books and leaflets and internet articles uh, attempting to do this that you can uh, find quite easily. Now, with this verse and others like it, we see that the Bible is being appealed to as an authority uh, for, for proof that Muhammad is a genuine prophet. And it's saying he's in the Torah and the gospel. And you can see this. And so that is... It, if you want to know whether or not Muhammad is a genuine prophet, then you are meant to be able to pick up the Bible and find him in the Torah and the prophets. Sorry, in the Torah and the gospel. That is, that the Quran actually, and it does this in a few different ways, it allows you to test it, to test Muhammad. It has other tests that it uses, but this is one of them. Now, if Muhammad is foretold in the Bible, then that means I would say he is a true prophet and everybody should accept him. Uh, but if he's not foretold in the Bible, then this verse in the Quran is false and Muhammad is false and he shouldn't be accepted. And so it's quite an important issue that we're discussing here tonight. And I hope that you will bear with me as I put forward the Christian position as to why we do not accept that Muhammad is foretold in the Bible. I'm going to be giving two reasons. The first is uh, that Muhammad does not fit into the message of the prophets. And the second is that there are no verses predicting Muhammad in the Bible. And I'll look at some of these here. Let's look at the first of these. Uh, Muhammad does not fit into the message of the prophets. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is I don't want to begin by looking at a particular verse. I just want to take the Bible as a whole. If we look at the whole Bible, what do we see? Well, the Bible itself is actually not one book, but a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1,500-year period. They come from different locations and different languages. It has the Law of Moses, the Gospel, and a whole range of other prophetic books in there. These books build on each other, and they are meant to be read together. And together, they give us God's complete message. And the message they give us is very clear. It's what Christians and Jews would call the, the story of redemption or redemptive history. And what I mean by that is I'll, I'll, I'll give you a summary of this story as you begin at, one, at the start of the Bible and work your way through. This is the story. The story is that God has made the world. God made the world good, but humanity has rebelled against God, has sinned against God, and as a result of this, we live under God's judgment. We're under the, uh, his judgment and under the, the judgment of death. Now, into this world, God speaks. God brings about a plan of salvation. And so we see this in terms of the covenants that God makes. And so there's the covenant with Noah, where the covenant with Noah is God's commitment to creation, to sustain creation. And then God makes a covenant with Abraham, 
And that covenant with Abraham is to bless all the nations through Abraham. Then God makes a covenant with the nation of Israel, and they are to be a kingdom of priests, a priestly nation that God speaks to the world through. They have this unique priestly role. And then there's the covenant that God makes with King David. And it's through David in this covenant that God promises to bring the Messiah. Now, this Messiah is the one who is going to fulfill all of the plans and purposes of God. And so we see that uh, the prophets will talk about God's resurrection kingdom to come. God's eternal kingdom, the eternal life that God will bring, the forgiveness of sins that God will bring, the new creation. And all of this hangs on the coming of the Messiah. This is just the story of the, of the prophets. Now, Jesus is this Messiah who is fulfilling these covenants, this, this plan of redemption, and bringing the resurrection, eternal life of God. He brings to a close the story that God has in the prophets. And so we read from the Apostle Paul, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes and amen in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, that's what we call redemptive history. And it's the message or the storyline throughout the prophets of the Bible. But when Muhammad comes, he doesn't teach this message. Whereas the prophet said that the Messiah would bring the fulfillment of all of God's plans, for Muhammad, this is not the case. Instead, the fulfillment of God's plans are all about him. He is the final prophet. He is bringing the final message of God. And he shows a different way to bring God's kingdom and another way to be saved. Muhammad tells a completely different story to the story that we find in the prophets. And what he says about himself doesn't fit with what the prophets say. Now, I just want to give you an illustration so you can understand this a bit better. The Quran itself has a story, and Muslims know this story. That is that God created everybody, God created the world, but people have forgotten God's words and turned away from God. And so into this world that is turned away from God, God has sent prophets to every nation. And the last of these prophets and the greatest is Muhammad. And so he is spoken of as the seal of the prophets in Surah 33, verse 40. Now, that, that's sort of the, the storyline of the Quran, isn't it? And so this helps Muslims to know whether or not they should accept somebody. And so when in uh, Persia, two men claim to be a prophet for the Baha'i religion, uh, Bab and Baha'i Allah, uh, they claim to be prophets after Muhammad, uh, their followers claim that these prophets are foretold in the, in the Bible and in the Quran. But Muslims reject this. Muslims reject the Baha'i because it doesn't fit into the, the story of the Quran, of the, the plan, the overall history that the Quran puts forward. Well, it's the same with Muhammad in the Bible. He just doesn't fit into the message that's there. So that's my first reason. Muhammad doesn't fit into the message of the Bible. I now want to look at my second reason, and that is to look at some of the verses that are put forward where Muslim leaders say that these predict the coming of Muhammad. The first point I need to say, of course, is that the Quran itself never quotes a verse from the Bible or, or any other book saying that this is what Muhammad fulfills. And so Islamic leaders read through the Bible, and I've taken a selection of the ones that they, they often refer to. Let's look at the first of these, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will raise up for you, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Now this is uh, God speaking to Moses and uh, Muslims look at this verse and they say, well, uh, that the claim is that when God says to Moses that he will raise up a prophet from among their brothers, that the phrase brothers here is referring to the Ishmaelites who were a brother nation to the Jews. Now, is this the case? I want to say no for the following reason, that if we read Deuteronomy 18 in its context, that is from chapters 17 to 18, we see that it's talking about leadership in Israel. It talks about the judges, the kings, the priests, and the prophets. And most of the time, they're described as being from, the prophet, from their brothers. And it, the, the context here is that the word brothers just means fellow Israelites. 
And so there's no reason to think that it means anything different when it comes to speaking of the prophet, sorry, of the prophet to come. The second reason I don't believe it's about Muhammad is because if you're going to be a prophet like Moses, you, you need to agree with him. And Muhammad's prophecy in the Quran simply doesn't agree with what Moses said. So in the Torah of Moses, God created us in his image. That's not a teaching in the Quran. The fatherhood and the son of God is one of the teachings of the Torah, but it's, it's rejected explicitly in the Quran. In the Torah, God comes to dwell with his people. In the Quran, we're on a journey to paradise. Uh, humanity is corrupted by sin in the Torah. There's the priesthood and the sacrifice of atonement to approach God. But these things are not in the Quran. Now, I'm just trying to take the big themes there. But you can see if you want to be like Moses, you, you do need to agree with him on the basics. And the last point I want to bring up is um, that if we read these verses in context, and I've, I've underlined the uh, verse 20, which is just a few verses on, we see that the prophet who speaks like Moses must, speak in, must not speak in the name of other gods. But what we find is that the name of God in the Torah, prophets and Psalms is this name Yahweh. But yet this is not the name that Muhammad prophesied in. Muhammad never spoke in the name of Yahweh. He spoke in the name of Allah. Now it may seem like a small point, but... The Bible's clear and the, the Torah is clear that the, the sacred name of God, Yahweh, is the name the prophet is meant to speak in. And this name is unknown in the Quran. And, and so I want to say that uh, Muhammad does not speak in the name of the God of Moses. The next verse I want to look at is Deuteron Deuteronomy uh, 33, where it says, He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of his holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Now, the claim here is that these uh, locations, Sinai, Seir, and Mount Paran, are referring to prophets. Uh, Mount Sinai is Moses, Seir is to Jesus, and Paran is to Muhammad. Well, is this the case? I want to say no. And we can see this just by reading it in its context. So the context of this verse is that Moses is blessing the Israelites. It's at the end of the Torah and Moses is blessing the Israelites as their journey from Egypt to Canaan comes to an end in what's called the Exodus. And Sinai, Paran and Seir are the places that they've been traveling through to get to their, their promised land. And what Moses is saying here, as you can see from the verse, is that the Lord came and was with them. And so the, the point of this verse is that Moses is praising God for being with his people. That's the context of the meaning of the verses. There's no mention in the verses of a prophet. There's no mention in the verses of, of revelation. And, and if there was, then you know, Jesus would be Jerusalem. He wouldn't be Seir which is uh, part of Edom. I'll move on to my third verse. Uh, the Song of Songs, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 16. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. He is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the claim here is that the Hebrew word for altogether lovely sounds like the word Muhammad, and, and it does. And because of this, this verse is a prophecy about Muhammad. I want to say this is not the case for two reasons. The first is because it's based on what's called a phonic fallacy. A phonic fallacy, phonic meaning sound. And it's the idea that if two words from different languages sound the same, then they sort of are the same and can be transferred. But you, you can't do that. You, sometimes you might be able to, but you've got to be careful. You just can't automatically do that. I'll give you an example. In the Quran, the word Allah is the name of God. Now, the word Allah is in the Hebrew Bible. It's in the Torah. And here it is. And it means oak tree. It means oak tree. Now, that doesn't mean that every time you read the word Allah in the Hebrew Bible that you've got a prophecy about Allah. It, 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 it's just it's a different language and it has the same word, but it has a different meaning. Uh, and also, now it is true that words can be descriptive. So, for instance, when 
Isaac was born, his, uh, when, uh, when Sarah was told that she was going to give birth to Isaac, she laughed. And so Isaac is the Hebrew word for laughter. So you can be given a name which is a descriptive name, but when we read this verse, it, it's not saying that the person will have this name. Whoops. It's not saying that the person will have this name. It's just giving a verse about, uh, it, it's in a wedding song. It's a, a song for a wedding, and it's talking about the male who's about to get married and how the woman thinks that he's amazing, which is a great thing. So I'll move on to my, uh, my next verse, and that is Isaiah 29. Now, Isaiah 29 reads, uh, Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, Read this, please, he will answer, I don't know how to read. And so uh, the claim is that Muhammad could not read, and this is referring to his experience in the cave when the angel asked him to read and he said that he couldn't. I want to say, though, that this verse is not about Muhammad, and if we just read the verse in context, we can see this. You'll notice that the verse before talks about someone who can read. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed on a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read, read this, please, he will answer, I can't, it's sealed. And so you can see it, it's actually talking about a scroll that can be read and people could read it, but it's sealed up. And it's actually referring to the vision that Isaiah has just given. But what's interesting here is that if we just read a few verses on, we actually find out when this scroll is going to be opened and when it will be understood. And look at what it says. It says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom the dark, uh, and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. So here's the time when the scroll is going to be opened. And what's going to be happening? The eyes will see, the blind will see, the deaf will hear. Now that's Jesus. That's actually saying that Jesus is the one who's going to release, uh, who's going to make known what was sealed in Isaiah. And that's actually what Jesus says in the gospel himself. Um, Isaiah 42 is another one. I, I won't look at that for the sake of time, but it's claimed that Muhammad is the prophet of, uh, is the servant of Isaiah 42 uh, because of the because he's from the tribe of Kedar, which is mentioned there. I don't think this is the case because when we read it, Kedar is rejoicing in the servant. It's not saying that the servant is from Kedar. My fast one, and I know this has been going very fast, um, is from John 14. And this is one that you may have heard where it says, uh, where Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. And the claim here is that the counsellor is Muhammad and that Jesus was foretelling the coming of Muhammad. Now, I want to say this is not the case because if we just read a few verses on, Jesus tells us who the counsellor is. He says, all this I have spoken to you while I was still with you. The counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said. So there has to be a place for reading in context. And if we do that, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the counsellor. Now, I just want to bring up another point here. If we actually let the Quran tell us who Jesus is speaking about, it also tells us that it's not Muhammad. Because the Holy Spirit, as Muslims would know, is in the Quran too. And in the, in the, in the Gospel of John and in the Quran, he is both called the Holy Spirit. He is both called the Spirit of Truth. In both books, he gives the revelation of God to the apostles. He can be in you. He opens people's hearts and he is sent by God and Jesus. And Muhammad does none of those things. So if we let the Quran tell us who is Jesus speaking about when Jesus describes the counsellor, the description that matches up to the Quran is actually the Holy Spirit in the Quran. It's not Muhammad. So I will finish up now uh, with my conclusion. Uh, I want to say th thank you for listening to me now. The Quran claims that Muhammad is foretold in the Bible. But as we have seen, there is simply no evidence for this. We've seen that Muhammad does not continue the message of the prophets and that he does not fit into their history and how God has worked in the world. Secondly, we've seen that the verses Muslim leaders claim are about Muhammad are not about him at all. If you're a Muslim, I ask you to consider this, because it is serious. If you're a Christian, I ask you to stick with the prophets 
and uh, how they point us to Jesus. And finally, if you are a seeker and you've come along tonight, I hope that I've uh, given you something to think about. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Uh, now going to give 20 minutes for Adnan to have his opening presentation. In the name of God, merciful, the beneficent, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, and the God of Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah ma ba'd. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I am honored to be in Perth. It is my first time in Australia, and shockingly, I was cold, <laughs> coming from Britain. Today's discussion is very important indeed. It uh, uh, goes right um, at the heart of Christian-Muslim dialogue. Muslims and Christians have differed on this matter for centuries. The Quran makes a very bold claim in chapter 7, verse 157, that um, the Prophet Muhammad is foretold in the previous scriptures, the scripture of the Jews as well as the Christians. And Samuel uh, produced a very fascinating presentation, fascinating for the reasons I will discuss later. But today, before I begin, I want to talk about the nature of Christian-Muslim dialogue. I am for a cordial relationship between Christians and Muslims. I have debated many Christians around the world, and one of the reasons I do these debates and dialogues is to prove to this world that Christians and Muslims can come together as brothers and sisters in humanity, share their differences, and live together and be happy. That's very possible. And I'm not for hate, not for division, not for misconceptions, deliberately spread misconceptions, what happens in many cases from both sides. There are many people out there in the US, in the UK, around the world for that matter, who spread active hate against Muslims from the Christian side and uh, Christians uh, against Christians from the Muslim side. So we have to disown extremists, wherever they may be, from both our uh, sides and this is the advice I've been given, uh, and this is the advice I would like to give to Samuel Green as well, that the spirit of religion must be merciful, compassionate, and generous, not the other way around. So that's the spirit we proceed in tonight. So the discussion, Prophet Muhammad in the Bible. I will come to the rebuttal later on. Uh, let's go straight into the topic, Muslim view on the Bible. Now, the discussion is about the Bible, not about the Quran. Is the Bible even trustworthy? This is the question a lot of Christians may be thinking of, that Muslims always claim that the Bible has been altered, it's been changed. Why are they even appealing to it? Now, this is where my point has to be clarified before I begin, that our view on the Bible is quite nuanced. We believe that the Bible in its current form is not uh, the original text written by its authors. No one ever claimed that. No one claims that. When I say no one, Samuel can come back and uh, pick my brains on that point and I can come back and give you evidence as to why I think that. M Jewish and Christian scholars in the world are unanimous today that what they possess in their hands as scripture is not in its pure form. It has been altered. In fact, we don't even know the language of these prophets. Uh, we don't know what language Moses spoke. We have no idea what language Jesus spoke. There is an assertion or there is an opinion that Jesus spoke Aramaic, a dialect of Amer Aramaic, and we have no book in the New Testament in that language. So later on, his words were translated into other languages, such as the Greek language, and when words are translated into another language, meaning is often lost. So you must keep that in mind. So our view is quite nuanced. We believe we do have elements of truth within the Bible, definitely. Definitely, we do believe in parts of the Bible. We believe the origin of those parts is definitely divine. However, on the other side, there are passages that cannot be from the prophets of God, let alone, let alone God himself. This has to be clarified. So we believe Bible contains truth, falsehood, and dubious information. And this is another topic. I have debated this topic with other scholars. You can go on YouTube and see my reasons as to why I believe that. 
So this was the Muslim view in, uh, on the Bible, and we do believe in parts of the Bible when they can be ascertained, when they can be proved to be right. So, straight to the topic. Who is that prophet? Samuel came and talked about why Muhammad, peace be upon him, cannot be that prophet. The prophet we will discuss. The prophet clearly mentioned in the text of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Samuel gave his reasons. He talked about a number of things. And when the biblical verses were read, they were read in a way that uh, we shall not or we should not uh, follow imposters. I agree with that 100%. You probably saw me nodding on, the, on those verses. When those verses were being read, I was nodding in affirmation. I actually believe that. Uh, that if a prophet speaks in the name of God and calls people to worship another God, we must not follow that so-called prophet. That's an imposter. That's a liar. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why we do not follow a number of Christian thinkers, because they were false prophets. If all the teachings attributed to Paul are Paul's, then we also believe that Paul was also a false prophet, foretold before his advent. In fact, when Jesus spoke of a person coming in his name, teaching people things completely the opposite of what Jesus had taught, then he, ma he has to be an imposter. When people are asking to worship another God other than the God of Israel, then they are imposters. For example, worshipping a man called Jesus. We believe Israelites were never told that. They were never told to worship a man in the form of the Messiah or in the form of a prophet who will appear in the first century CE. That's another topic. We will debate that topic the day after tomorrow. Is Jesus God? And a lot of these things will be discussed in that debate. So who is that prophet being talked about in John? It is clear that the Jewish people in the first century were expecting three people to arrive. Right? Who are these people? And they are distinct personalities. They were expecting a Messiah, the Christ. They were expecting Elias or Elijah. And they were expecting that prophet. That prophet. Now, these were three distinct persons. The Jews understood, uh, understood them to be three distinct persons. And neither John nor Jesus, John the Baptist I'm talking about. Neither John the Baptist nor Jesus controverted this di distinction. None of them. They did not controvert this distinction. They accepted it because they were silent about it. Right? So the Christ was, to cut the long story short, to save time, Christ was the Messiah. Jesus. Jesus Christ was the Messiah as we the Muslims accept and the Christians accept that. John the Baptist was called Elias in the book of Matthew, but in the Gospel of John somehow uh, that was a misunderstanding. That's another topic which we will not indulge in. This is to do with contradiction within the Bible. Then who is that prophet? When you look at the footnotes in the Bibles today, you will see this refers to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, right? So when Christians claim that that prophet refers to Jesus Christ, they have to qualify Jesus Christ to be. We believe Je there are many prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, like the Christians do. What the Christians do with those prophecies is very, very uh, inconsistent when it comes to similar prophecies about Prophet Muhammad, as we will see in due course. None of the prophecies in the Old Testament mentions Jesus Christ by name, not one of them. All of them have to be interpreted, they have to be stretched, they have to be explained to fit Jesus into that context. And the Jewish people have for centuries rejected that interpretation. And I believe, with apology, by the way, anything I say tonight is not meant to hurt you or, or upset you or in some way, um, um, uh, you know, insult your religion or your views. Rather, I'm only trying to fear, uh, you know, share my ideas so that you can know what I believe in and what other Muslims believe in. So please rest assured that the purpose or the intention is not to hurt your feelings. Rather, it is to express my view, which you may disagree with happily. No problem. I have no issue with that if you disagree with that. So what the Jewish people did to the, to the Christ, to Jesus Christ, when he appeared and he claimed to be a prophet, the Jewish people rejected him and they... All the prophets 
prophecies pertaining to Jesus Christ, they rejected them. They said they cannot apply to this man. He's an imposter. He will, he's a sorcerer. He is an, a, an, a, a, he's a child from adultery. And there are many things Jewish people um, uh, accuse Jesus of. But they rejected him. And they rejected all those prophecies about him. I believe, unfortunately, today Christians do the same with Prophet Muhammad. They do exactly the same with Prophet Muhammad. They use reasons, sometimes erroneous, to reject a true prophet of God, who is clearly foretold in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, as we will see in due course. So that prophet was definitely not the Christ. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is still unfulfilled if it does not refer to Prophet Muhammad, because Jesus was not that prophet. He was the Christ. Because if he was the Christ, he could not possibly be that prophet. And if he was that prophet, in inverted commas, that prophet, he could not be Christ at the same time because this distinction was very, very clear to the Jewish people, to John the Baptist and to Jesus Christ. So that prophet, who is that prophet in Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is the question. If it is not Jesus, and it was not Jesus definitely, as we will see in due course, um, then the prophecy remains unfulfilled, which is a problem, if it's not Muhammad. Before we get into that, I need to talk about Ishmael. Uh, a lot of the Christian scholars and Christian activists and apologists, they like to claim that Ishmael is not even part of the covenant. Therefore, anyone coming from Ishmael cannot be of God or cannot be from the blessings of God. But this notion is quite false when you look at the Bible carefully. Actually, one of my friends from, uh, from the UK, his name is Zakir Hussain, he had an extensive debate with an apologist from the US uh, called David Wood. And this particular debate was about this very question, the covenant and the status of Ishmael. I'm not, go I'm not going to indulge in the details. I'm just simply mentioning it, mentioning it passingly. So who is Ishmael? Ishmael is uh, from the seed of Abraham and God promised Abraham that he will bless his seed. That means Ishmael also. Covenant was established with the seed of Abraham. Abraham demonstrated that covenant or he materialized the co covenant, the beginning of the covenant would be by circumcision. Abraham circumcised himself so, and he also circumcised his son Ishmael. So both were part of the covenant. Later on, Isaac was also part of the covenant. So as you can see on the screen there, Genesis 21, 13 clearly tells us that Ishmael was the seed or from the seed of Abraham from his wife, Hagar. She was his wife as the Bible clearly mentions that. For some reason, after the post-exilic period, I don't want to go into history too much, not to complicate things. Um, after when the Bible was written down after the Babylonian exile, some of the Jewish rabbis, according to some scholars, they decided to take Ishmael out of the covenant. And covenant was established with Isaac, not Ishmael. And this is a huge topic. It is a huge problem from, uh, for, for, for Christian and Jewish scholars. They cannot possibly reconcile verses about Ishmael in the book of Genesis and uh, onwards and the fact that his age was 13 when he was um, uh, sorry he was a teenager 17 not 13 when he was carried allegedly carried by his mother into the wilderness uh, this doesn't make sense a woman cannot be carrying as a child it is clearly demonstrated in the words that he was a child when the mother carried him in the wilderness right he cannot be a child and be a teenager at the same time almost 17 years old so these are some of the inconsistencies in the, in the text of the Bible in the Old Testament. Christian and Jewish scholars have wrestled with these texts for centuries. So Ishmael is very important. He, he was definitely under the covenant of God, which was a blessing. And God promised Abraham that he will multiply into many nations and bless him. He will be blessed by God. So... For that reason, Prophet Muhammad was part of that particular blessing, as we will see in the coming uh, texts. Deuteronomy 33, 2, which Samuel talked about, there are three locations mentioned there. As he mentioned clearly, these three locations are also mentioned in Habakkuk, actually one of them, Paran in particular. I am concerned with Paran. Uh, where are these locations? If you look at the map, this is where they are, according to geographers. Um, 
Sinai, biblical geographers, I mean. Sinai is in Egypt and it refers to Moses, right? Sire is uh, in Palestine, it's a mountain range in Palestine. Paran is Arabia. Now there is some confusion about Paran, whether it is um, in the Sinai Peninsula or whether it is actually in mainland Arabia. That, that question will be resolved later on. Sinai refers to Moses, as it is clear. Sire is a mountain range in uh, Palestine. As you can see clearly, it refers to Jesus Christ because Moses never came to Palestine in his life. He never made it to Palestine. So Sire cannot be a reference to Moses. It has to be a reference to Jesus. So who is the third person? Paran. What happened in Paran? Paran is, according to most biblical scholars, is Arabia, without a doubt. What happened in Arabia is the question. When we look at the prophecy, it states, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed, blessed, sorry, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai. This is a prophecy, by the way and rose up from Sire unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law. So, three locations clearly. Just like we have prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, and we uh, put so much stress on those prophecies and do our best to prove why they refer to Jesus, like that, we are showing the Christians as to why we believe this particular passage cannot be possibly talking about anyone else but three persons, Moses, Jesus, and Paran refers to Muhammad because he is the most powerful prophet uh, who came from Arabia. And when Samuel said that there is nothing, please mark the words, there is nothing about Muhammad in the Bible, right? That's what Samuel said, if I understood him correctly. There's nothing about Muhammad in the Bible. Can you imagine that? Christians claim that there are thousands of prophecies about minor events. Even the Pope, some of the Popes are foretold in the Bible. And there's nothing about such a great man, such a great man who created one of the most magnificent civilizations in human history, whose people, whose followers governed from northern China all the way up to Spain. For over a thousand years they created a civilization of an unprecedented scale with hundreds of thousands of people flourishing with bookmaking, book collecting, scientists, philosophers, thinkers, poets, Jewish scholars, Christian scholars living in harmony with Muslims under the domain of Islam for over a thousand years. What happened to that civilization? There's nothing in the Bible about that? Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. If Bible is the word of God, partly which we do believe it is, then where is the prophecy about such a great man who did such great things? Do Christians ever see anything positive in the life of Prophet Muhammad? All his teachings about orphans, widows, his eradication of poverty, his defense of the, uh, the rights of women, his defense of the rights of animals, him, him talking about climate, how we have to defend and protect, his, his teachings about forestation, not deforestation, rather forestation, all these positive things. There's nothing in the Bible about this person who taught so many noble things. You should know a man or a prophet by his fruits, right? And of course, um, many Christians are not told about this fruit, unfortunately. Um, but this is the job of the Muslims. We have to tell you about this fruit so that you can actually go and assess um, this person yourself. So Habakkuk 3.3, 3, chapter 3, verse 3, it also talks about something to do with Arabia. Taiman is northern Arabia, according to biblical geographers, where Prophet Muhammad migrated and the city of Medina is very close to Taiman. Actually, it's in the valley of Taima. And Sela is a mountain in the city of Medina. If you were to Google Sela right now, you will come up, or what will come up is a Wikipedia page. And when you see Sela, Sela is a mountain in Medina. So Sela and then Paran is also mentioned. So three locations, Taiman. Sela, how, how much time do you have? One minute. And Paran, three locations. Okay, Sela is very specific to Medina, Taiman is the valley, and Paran is the region. This is very, very clear. So, 
even chrono chronologically, if you look at this uh, prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, 18, you see what's happening here. Okay, uh, Lord came. This doesn't mean God himself came, but rather his people, his prophets came. This is the biblical language. This is how the Bible speaks. Lord came, right? This is Moses. He rose up. This is Jesus. And he shined forth like the midday from Arabia. Something happened in Arabia. And we will see when I come back for the second rebuttal what happened in Arabia. So what have we seen so far? We have seen that Arabia is very special in the Bible. There is something hap happening in Arabia. And the question is, why is Arabia so important in the Bible? What happened there? If there was a prophet there, is he important? Is he foretold in the Bible? And the remaining part will be discussed in the first rebuttal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, we're now going to have a series of rebuttals. We'll have a first rebuttal of 10 minutes each, and then a second rebuttal of five minutes. So I'll invite Sam up to have his first rebuttal. OK, well, thank you, Adnan. Great to be uh, speaking with you again. I'll go through the points that you raised. Uh, your first point was the Muslim view of the Bible. And in one sense, I think that that has a lot to do with this. I'll just go back to where I was. Probably should have gone there beforehand. Um, but uh, the, the, when the Quran makes claims about the Bible, it is very common for Muslims to say if the claim doesn't seem to be working out, oh, but the Bible's been changed. And it, it's just what we hear as Christians all the time. You know, the Quran claims something. Uh, we look at it. It doesn't seem to be true. Oh, well, the Bible's been changed. And, and really, in many ways, that's what's... Um, sorry, I've got lost my place here. Um, the, the, this is one of the issues that we have to uh, deal with in that it's very common for, for there to be three responses to Muhammad not being found in the Bible. The first is to say, well, the Bible's been changed and it's not reliable, and that's why he's sort of not there as clear as you might think. Uh, the second is to say, well, is to an attempt to do it, and that's what a lot of books do. But the third one is actually the Gospel of Barnabas and the Gospel according to Islam, where Muslim leaders have actually rewritten the Gospel to make it foretell the coming of Muhammad. And so th this sort of dismissing of the Bible is a common thing that we have to, uh, that Christians have to face. And I guess I just want to say, I, I don't think it, it helps our dialogue that whenever, um, that whenever, you know, we say something from, uh, from the Bible, you say, well, it's been changed. When I've read the Quran, it actually says that each community has its own book and it's to judge by its own book, that Christians have the gospel that Jesus uh, had. It actually says that explicitly. There's to be no distinction made between any of the holy books. God's word cannot be changed. Jews and Christians are to read their books. Even Mohammedan Muslims can read the books. And as we've seen, Muhammad is foretold in there. Um, and so th this is one of the things as Christians that when we're having dialogue, the Bible's often attacked as a way of just excusing why uh, the evidence for Islam is not there. Uh, you, you mentioned the Apostle Paul being a false prophet. I, I just want to point out, as I showed on my diagram, that Paul, uh, the Christians don't just read Paul. Christians actually read all of the prophets. And uh, this is what's different between Christianity and Islam. Let me just get it here. Where are you? There we go. Um, the Bible is not just the Apostle Paul. The Bible has the law of Moses, it has the books of the prophets, it has the Psalms of David, the books of the gospel. Christians actually believe all the prophets and we're the ones who read them. We don't have one man telling us what to believe about the other prophets. We actually read all the prophets ourselves and that's what the Bible is. It's actually all of the prophets. Now, uh, the, the idea that uh, Jesus, uh, the, the, there's no prophecy in the Old Testament that Jesus is mentioned by name, there actually is. It's in Zechariah chapter 6, where at the return of the exile, a man named Yeshua, or Jesus, is uh, given a symbolic event. It's um, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. And what happens is that the prophet comes up to this priest and he makes a crown and he says to the priest, I'm going to put this crown on your head, Joshua, and you're going to be a priest who rules. And there's going to be a harmony between the priest, the priest and the king are going to come together. 
And it's Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. And the man that that happens to, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And it says in Zechariah that he is a prophecy of what God is going to do in the future. So there actually is a prophecy for the priest king coming in the future called Jesus. Uh, you mentioned how Christians force uh, interpretations of the Old Testament to make them foretell the coming of Jesus. My problem with you saying that is that Muslims are meant to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so the, the, the prophecies in the Old Testament, in the Torah and in the Jewish scriptures that are about Jesus, I thought you'd be with us in saying Jesus is the Messiah. They are about him. And so um, I'm not sure why you want to say that, uh, you know, the, looking at the looking at the Old Testament and that Christians are forcing an interpretation when you should be agreeing with us that Jesus is the Messiah. I'll move on to Ishmael. Uh, you mentioned that Ishmael uh, was originally part of the covenant. I'll look at a couple of verses with this. The first is that the book of Genesis is clear that Ishmael, along with all of Abraham's children, is going to be blessed. So there's no... There's no doubt about that. But in verse 19, it says, uh, God said, No, your wife Sarah, uh, so God's speaking to Abraham, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He will father tribal leaders, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac. And so we see there that uh, the Bible is clear that the covenant just doesn't go to everyone. It goes to whom God chooses. And it doesn't go to Ishmael. It goes to Isaac. And we actually see this in the next generation. Because when Isaac has children, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And even though Jacob is the firstborn, the covenant goes to Jacob. And it's God showing that he chooses and he is sovereign in who he chooses. And so we see this pattern elsewhere. It's not just with, with Ishmael, it's with others. You mentioned that the story of uh, that, that what I've read here has been changed. And you were talking about uh, you know, the, the Jewish scholars after the exilic period were changing these scriptures. I, I want some evidence that it has actually been changed. Not just from someone saying it has, but some textual evidence. And the evidence you gave was from uh, chapter 21, where you're saying that the story doesn't make sense because I, uh, Ishmael, who's a young man, is being carried by his mother. But that's not actually what she's carrying. She's carrying the water. If you go and read the story, uh, so it's verse 14. Uh, Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a wineskin, put them on Hagar's shoulder and sent her away with the boy. He's not putting this boy on her shoulders. He's putting the food supplies on her shoulders and then they're going off. So there's no evidence that the story has been changed. The story is consistent that it's God's sovereign choice who he, who he chooses and who he establishes his covenant with. All right. Now, um, I'll just a side point. You're saying that we, uh, you know, Christians find nothing positive in Muhammad, nothing positive to say about him. Well, that's sort of not the discussion tonight. Tonight the discussion is, is he foretold in the Bible? Um, I enjoy writing Arabic. I've been learning Arabic. I studied this, the verse for tonight in Arabic, and so I enjoy writing it and learning the language. I don't have any problem with it, but it's just not the topic of, of tonight. So, um, you know, I, I see positive things in Islam, but that's just not the topic tonight. You also mentioned if Muhammad... Is, is, Muhammad is such this, a, a great figure, um, then why isn't he mentioned in the Bible? Why isn't he mentioned, you know? Uh, well, all I can say is, and you, you know, you're saying people say the Pope's in there and everything else. I'd say the Pope's not in there. That's just Christians being silly when they say the Pope's <laughs> predicted in there. People try to foretell everything from the Bible because it gives them a justification. But if we're going to say why isn't Muhammad in there, you know, why isn't the computer in there? Why isn't space travel in there? You know, there's a lot of things we could say which are big and significant. And so it's not really a reason to say, well, he's not in there. So, you know, the Bible, you know, he should be in there. Well, we can't tell God what he's going to put in. Uh, the Quran doesn't talk about space travel or 
um, computers either. So, you know, it talks about a certain subject and it, it's fine for it to talk about that subject, that's okay. Um, finally, when we were looking at uh, Deuteronomy 33 uh, and those three locations, I'll just finish up with this, where we were looking at Sinai, Seir and Paran, I just want to say again that that verse is, is not talking about prophets, it's not talking about revelation. It's talking about the places that the Israelites went as they came out of Egypt and how God was with them. And so it, you know, if it said these people represent prophets, then sure, but it's, it's just not saying that. So um, I don't think we can read that into it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, Adnan will now have 10 minutes for his first rebuttal. Thank you, Samuel. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much for that rebuttal. Uh, I'll quickly pick on a few points, and then um, we'll move on to my presentation. Um, you said we don't accept Jesus and the prophecies about him in the Bible. I said we do. I, I don't think you heard me uh, clearly. We do accept prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament when they talk about the Messiah. Definitely, 100%. We accept them, right? Likewise, we accept prophecies about Prophet Muhammad in the Old Testament when they do talk about him, uh, when a prophet from Arabia is clearly foretold, it can't be anyone else. And if Muhammad was a false prophet, God forbid, uh, then he was a very big false prophet. Very, very, very dangerous false prophet, right? Because he did so many great things he did so many noble things. He fulfilled so many prophecies. And he made so many prophecies that came to pass. To prove him to be a false prophet is not an easy task. And this is why we are Muslims. We are not Muslims because we were born into Muslim families. No, not myself, not me. Right? We have studied. I have studied the biblical text for the last um, at least 15 years. So. We do accept those prophecies. When it comes to textual evidence of the, Bible, uh, the corruption of the Bible or the text of, uh, text of the Bible, Jeremiah 8.8, 8, Prophet Jeremiah talks about it, that the scribes of the law have corrupted it. Their corrupting pen has corrupted the law. Now you can come back and explain to us as to what that means. And this is not, again, a discussion on the corruption of the Bible. I have debates. I have had debates with Christian scholars on that point. With regards to covenant, I'm not going to indulge in that again. Uh, there are many passages in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis and onwards, where the biblical text is simply not consistent. For example, one give exa one short example. Who, who is the circum who is the sacrificed son, according to the biblical text? He is supposed to be the the firstborn or the only child of Abraham, according to the text, right? But that was not true. When Isaac was born, Ishmael was already 13 years old, so Ishmael was the firstborn. So the sacrificed child could not be Isaac. Either Isaac was not the firstborn or he was not the sacrificed child. These are some inconsistencies in the text of the Bible regards to, with regards to covenant. Then you mentioned a few things uh, about um, brethren uh, when it refers to uh, I will raise you up a prophet from your brethren. You said it has to be Israelites. No, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 7, Edomites, who are not Israelites, are called the brethren of Israelites. By that virtue, the Ishmaelites are more of brethren uh, for Israelites than Edomites are. Right? So, all I have to do is show you one example in the Bible where another people are referred to as, breth as the brethren of Israelites. My job is done. My case is, uh, my, my mission is accomplished. To show you that the Ishmaelites, the Arabs, are the brethren of the Israelites. By that reason... By that reasoning, uh, this prophecy definitely refers to Prophet Muhammad. Right. So, in 1818, we are told that there will be a prophet like Moses. God promised that a prophet like Moses will come. Not from the Israelites necessarily, but from the brethren of the Israelites. And what is Moses like? Christians a lot of the time claim that this is Jesus. And now we will see why it cannot be Jesus, why it has to be Prophet Muhammad. We will see a Moses-like prophet. Moses and Muhammad both had parents and had natural birth. Jesus did not. Moses and Muhammad both married and had children. Jesus did not. 
both were eventually accepted by their people and their people followed them Jesus did not have that privilege both governed in this world as rulers and established order they applied the God-given law Jesus did not in fact Jesus said my kingdom of is not of this world when he was put in front of Pontius Pilate he said my kingdom is not of this world when the adulteress was brought to him for adultery although the passage is according to many biblical scholars is an interpolation that particular story is an interpolation into the text of the Bible it's a corruption but because you believe in it it's in your Bible I will use it Jesus refused to stone her why because he said in front of Pontius Pilate my kingdom is not of this world he was unlike Moses for that reason both were lawgivers and brought new laws and this law was foretold in the book of Isaiah 42 which Samuel for some reason amazingly didn't even mention in his rebuttal or in his uh, uh, response to the Muslim claims Isaiah 42 is the most powerful reference to Prophet Muhammad in the Bible we will see why I say that both led migrations of their followers both migrated or emigrated both defeated the enemies both of them were triumphant against the enemies Moses defeated Pharaoh by the help of God Prophet Muhammad was triumphant against his enemies within his life his armies were already fighting the Romans both defeated the enemies both died of natural causes while in power and were buried unlike Jesus both were humans not God unlike Jesus as the Christians claim right Christians claim Jesus is God so how is he like Moses if he's God Moses was not God even though Moses is the only human um, who is called God in a singular way in a singular sense um, uh, in the entire text of the Bible uh, in the book of Exodus chapter 7 verse 1 God tells Moses that I have made you a God to Pharaoh with small g right so if anyone should be God according to the Bible it should be Moses not Jesus because Jesus is not called God by himself anywhere in the text of the Bible both became prophets at 40 unlike Jesus Jesus was a prophet when he was born we believe that according to the Quran we are told Jesus was a prophet of God in the cradle he defended his mother from the cradle so these are some very powerful points that need your consideration so Jesus is nothing like Moses in fact Jesus never claimed to be like Moses Jesus never claimed to be that prophet foretold in Deuteronomy 18 18 that prophet never came if Muhammad is not a true prophet of God that prophecy remains unfulfilled John the Baptist refused to accept that he was that prophet so did Jesus because Jesus was the Christ self-confessedly Jesus was the Christ if he was the Christ he could not be that prophet who is that prophet who is that prophet again Deuteronomy 34 10 tells us and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses and Samaritan Torah if you read it it says there will never arise such a prophet in Israel if not in Israel then where is the question in the brethren of the Israelites the Arabs so we go to Isaiah 42 now Isaiah has some very interesting prophecies the most powerful one in my opinion is Isaiah 42 which mentions some very specific points with regards to this person who is coming from Arabia why do I say that these are some of the qualities mentioned in the entire chapter when you read the chapter and if you know the life of the Prophet of Islam Prophet Muhammad you will see him in this prophecy no one else why because it specifically mentions his location specifically it's not even vague it is very specific with all the qualities he came with he was the chosen one we are told from his own biography that he was the chosen one of God he was very gentle in his behavior uh, if we were to believe all the stories Samuel has been writing on Islam answering Islam in his articles because he uses a lot of uh, um, inauthentic or unauthentic informa uh, Islamic information to make a lot of his arguments uh, if he was to read the authentic stuff he would come to realize that Prophet Muhammad was a very gentle man he was a very gentle man um, he brought judgment for the earth his people governed uh, from one corner of the earth, uh, earth to the other his law the, the Hebrew word there in the prophecy is the Torah and this is a Torah after the Torah of Moses and no Israelite prophet ever claimed to have brought another Torah this is a new law 
which this prophet, this prophet king will bring. Christopher North is a biblical scholar specifically specializing in the book of Isaiah in his commentary on this particular passage in his book Suffering, Suffering Servant in Deutero Isaiah, Suffering Servant in Deutero Isaiah published by the Oxford University, University Press. He stated that this judgment is something like the Arab Deen or the Arabic uh, 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 religion or Islam. This is what he said, Islam. He used the word Islam. So this new law came with no one else but Prophet Muhammad. It's a comprehensive law. Islam is a very comprehensive way of life. He came, he will come as a light for Gentiles. He will put idol worshippers to shame. And he has something to do with Kedar, where the people of Kedar live. Kedar was the second son of Ishmael, according to the book of Genesis chapter 25, verse 13. Kedar was the second son of Ishmael, a direct ancestor of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, according to the biography of Prophet Muhammad himself. So Kedar was in Arabia. Prophet Muhammad was a direct descendant. This particular passage mentions the location directly and it mentions the Mount Sela, which is in Medina. And he will triumph against his enemies and he will be a messenger of God. All of these things put together, if they do not fit Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then they do not fit anyone else in the history of humanity. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, we're now going to move on to our second round of rebuttals, uh, which will go for five minutes each. So I invite Sam up. Okay, thank you, Adnan. Excellent. Um, so let's look at each of these points in these uh, brief five minutes that I have now. Adnan correctly pointed to the fact that the Edomites are referred to as the brothers, uh, a brother nation to the Israelites. And, and that is true. And I fully acknowledge that, but that doesn't prove your point because we need to read in context. And as I pointed out uh, when I was looking at Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, that when we read the verses in context, they're talking about leadership in Israel. And it's talking about the judges, the kings, the priests, the prophets, and they're all from their brothers. Now, it's not saying that they're going to have Edomites ruling over them. No, it's saying they're going to be a, a brother Israelite. That's just what the context says. So the word brother can mean Edomites and Ishmaelites. I agree that it can mean that. But when we read it in context, it's repeated several times that it's referring to a brother Israelite. Uh, my second point was uh, that I want to bring up was you're saying that there's, uh, there was Elijah to come, the Christ and the prophet and that there needs to be three. Well, there actually doesn't need to be three. So for instance, King David is the Messiah of the Old Testament. He's called one of them, he's one of the Messiahs. There's a whole series of Messiahs in the Old Testament. And David is a prophet who gave the, uh, the, 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 the Psalms, who wrote the Psalms for us. And so here we see that the, the prophet king uh, is actually a, a biblical model of what the Messiah is. Just in the same way that the Messiah is going to be a priest in Zechariah 6, which I showed you, the priesthood comes into the, to the, the king. So too, we see that the, the, uh, the prophethood comes into the king as well in David, because he was the Messiah and he was the prophet king. In the transfiguration accounts of Jesus, where he's exalted uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, God actually quotes Deuteronomy 18.18 18 and says, this is my son, listen to him. And so it's a combination of two quotes from the Old Testament, and it actually identifies Jesus as the, uh, as the, the, the Messiah pro prophet. Um, now, in terms of the uh, Bible being corrupted, I, I think that we need to, as I said, that this often comes up. And we do need to be honest with this, because I think a lot of Muslims will just assume, you know, the Bible is, you know, corrupted and, and, and so we don't have to worry about it. But... In the early centuries of Islam, there were synoptic Qurans, different Qurans collected by different companions. These were standard, standardized into one Quran. And then even today, there are 10 different Qur'ats, which are different Arabic recitations of the Quran used around the world today. Uh, I've actually got a set of, um, it's a book which lists all the, the variants, and there's over 10,000 variants. So the Quran that we have here that I've got today, that's just one amongst many different Arabic versions that are out there. And, uh, and so if we're going to attack the Bible, I need to say something about the Quran, otherwise you're going to get a false impression that there's one Quran and the Bible's corrupted. That's actually not the case, and I've got a leaflet for it up the back. Um, now, was 
uh, Muhammad like, more like Moses than Jesus. You said, well, Muhammad was like Moses in this way and Jesus wasn't. And look, you can certainly make those comparisons, but in the end, you end up choosing the things that you think best, because I can make a different list. I can say, Jesus agreed with the, the basic teaching of, of Moses, the idea of a sacrifice for sin, the image of God, all those things that I had in that table before. Jesus agrees with Muhammad, that Jesus agrees with Moses, Muhammad doesn't agree with Moses. Uh, we've also got the fact that Jesus and Moses are both Israelites, and both of them were known for the miraculous signs that they gave. Whereas Muhammad in the Quran uh, is, uh, what is it? Uh, there's a whole series of surahs. Actually, I, I, had, I did have the verse here, but I'm not going to be able to find it now. And there's hadiths about Muhammad not giving signs, but that the Quran is his only sign. And so Deuteronomy 30, I think it's Deuteronomy 33 or 34, the last chapter, it says, no prophets come like Moses who did all the signs like him. And that's the chief comparison. Muhammad just didn't do that. Isaiah 42, um, it actually says that it, if you read the rest of Isaiah, uh, particularly Isaiah 49, it identifies the servant as the nation of Israel and as the faithful remnant within Israel. And so if we just read Isaiah and say, who is the servant? We come to the answer that it's uh, the, the, the faithful Israelite, who in the end is the Messiah King of Israel. I need to finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Now I invite Anana. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Samuel, for another passionate uh, presentation. Very quickly, because time is very short. Uh, you said the last point was Isaiah is referring to the nation of Israel, not to one particular servant. I want you to now apply the same standard, same criteria to the prophecy you always use for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Isaiah 53. There you claim that this prophecy refers to one person, Jesus Christ. Here when it comes to Isaiah 42, which clearly talks about one person, Isaiah 53 is very, very vague. Jewish rabbis have um, argued for centuries that this refers to the state of Israel, or not the state of Israel, sorry, the tribe of Israel, the tribe of Israel, the Israelites in general. But the Christians insist, no, this is about Jesus Christ. You said servant in Isaiah means the tribe of Israel. Is that correct? Am I misquoting Samuel? No? Okay. So if that's the case, then Jesus is not the person foretold in uh, Isaiah 53, and we will shake hands on that later on, because this is what we say as well, right? Okay, different Qurans. I, okay, uh, to, to put it simply, find me one manuscript out of all the hundreds of thousands of manuscripts we have in the world, in any library on the planet, any manuscript of the Quran for, from the first three centuries of Islam. Find me one manuscript that contains verses, or that omits verses, we find in the Quran today. This is a very clear challenge, and no one can mistake, uh, you know, you, you can't misunderstand my challenge, it's very simple. Find me any verses in the Quran there, on the table, which cannot be found in any of the manuscripts around the world, anywhere in the world. Now, ask me to put the same challenge about your Bible on the table, and the manuscripts in the Christian world. You will never put that challenge to me, and I dare Samuel to come back and put that challenge to me. If Samuel does not put that challenge to me, that means my case is done. Right? So Jesus agrees with Moses. No, he does not. If Jesus is a Trinitarian, which you claim he was, Jesus does not agree with Moses. He went against the basic tenet of the faith of Moses. Moses taught Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Jesus taught the same thing, by the way. We believe he taught the same thing. But later on, Christians claimed he was actually a secret closet Trinitarian. He never taught the Trinity, but he actually believed in it. He meant it. And he was playing games with his words with his disciples, not teaching them the Trinity uh, clearly. Clearly enough for them to actually believe in it or state it clearly in the first three centuries of Christianity. This topic will be debated uh, indirectly the day after tomorrow. The Gospel of Barnabas was written by Muslims. Really? Give me the name of the Muslim who wrote the Gospel of Barnabas. 
As far as I know, the earliest manuscript of the Gospel of Barnabas is from the 16th century. It was written by a man called Fra Marino, right? And none of them claimed that it was actually written by a Muslim, right? And we don't have to use it. I never mentioned it. That was like a straw man uh, argument. I never mentioned the Gospel of Barnabas. I don't claim uh, for it to be authoritative. It is just uh, a text out there, and we don't have to believe in it. We don't have to even follow it. It is not our Gospel, by the way. The four Gospels, as they are, are enough for us to show why Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet of God. Coming to Parakletos, uh, the comforter, um, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, allegedly, in the chapter, uh, cha chapter 16, that I will send you another comforter. The Christians claim that that is the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is already there. There are so many passages in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was already there functioning. Jesus said, another comforter, another. That means someone other than the Holy Spirit that's already frequenting the planet, right? This cannot be the same comforter. And if this is another comforter, and comforter actually paraclete in the Greek language actually means advocate. Because when the same word is translated in the same Bible on the table there, referring to Jesus in the first epistle of John, he is referred to as paraclete. Jesus is called the paraclete in the first epistle of John. There, the word is translated as advocate. In the gospel of John, chapter 16, the term is translated as comforter. I say they both mean advocate. Advocate means shafi' in the Arabic language, the intercessor. And this is exactly what the Muslims believe, that the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, will intercede on the part of his followers. So parakletos or Paraclete was no one other than the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even Jesus, before he went, he said, he will glorify me. No one glorified and defended Jesus more than the Prophet of Islam because he re re received the text from God and Quran defends the mother of Jesus in an entire chapter, chapter 19, and the Quran defends Jesus against all the false charges against him. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, we're now coming to the question and answer segment of this evening. Uh, we're going to have 25 minutes for you guys, the audience, to submit some questions. Uh, as the screen says, uh, questions for Sam and questions for Adnan both go to two different numbers, so try not to mix them up. Uh, each uh, speaker will have three minutes to respond to a question, um, and they'll just uh, come up uh, at different times. Um, so please get uh, those questions in. Uh, we'll start with Sam first. Uh, I believe Amit has that So one question for you is regarding the prophet um, that is mentioned in the book of John 124. You said that they can be the same person, but if you read 7, uh, John chapter um, 7, verse 40, it says, some said that this is the prophet, and others said this is the Christ. Now, why would the Jews make this distinction? If this is the same person, why would they not say this is the Christ and the prophet? But they said one said this, that he's a prophet, and the other said that he is a Christ. So there is a distinction between the two. Um, well, I'd simply say that when, um, when God says he's going to send you know, the priest, the prophet, the king, all these people, exactly how God fulfills that is according to how he wants to fulfill it. And people may have thought that, people absolutely thought that, but that doesn't mean it's right, just because it, just because it records a Jew saying, uh, is he this or is he that? That doesn't mean that they can't be the same. As I've shown with King David, King David was the Messiah, and he's also the um, uh, he's also the, the a prophet. And so, in the Bible, he's a, both a king and a, a Messiah and a prophet. And we actually see this happening with the Messiah. In that, as I showed before, from Zechariah six, and it's also Psalm one hundred and ten. Not only does the Messiah have this prophetic role, but he also has a priestly role. And so we see that the, the offices of priest, prophet, king are coming in, in the, in the previous prophets before Jesus, on the Messiah in terms of when God is speaking about the future. Um, so just because, people in the, just because the Bible records people thought it could be this or could be that doesn't mean it is. We've got to see how it comes together itself. And there's precedent for that in the Old Testament. Uh, hi, my name's David. I work with the uh, Christian Union on campus. Um, 
I think it's a short question, so I'm going to ask this one, and then I'll, and then you can tell me if you think it's a short one, and I'll ask you another one. It's just a question: What does unlettered mean? That the Prophet Muhammad is unlettered. Uh, the longer question, I think that you'd rather answer is: uh, Do we have any record of Jesus himself foretelling Muhammad or creating an expectation of a new prophet? Sorry, repeat that question, please. Do we have any record of Jesus himself foretelling Muhammad or creating an expectation of a new prophet? Okay, very quickly, uh, answer your first question. Uh, unlettered means someone who doesn't know how to read and write. Okay, unlettered doesn't necessarily mean illiterate. And this refers to the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12. Uh, it states, when the book is given to the one who is not learned, and it is said to him, read, and he will say, I am not learned. This is exactly what happened to Prophet Muhammad in the cave of Hira. When the angel uh, Gabriel appeared to him, and said to him, read Iqra in the Arabic language. He said, Ma in, I am not learned. This is what he said, I am not learned. Exactly the same words. And for that reason, when he went to the city of Mecca and he said what happened uh, in the cave, he told uh, exactly, I mean, he told what happened. Uh, he told uh, a scholar, a biblical scholar who was in the, uh, in the city of Mecca. His name was Waraka bin Nawfal. Uh, Waraka told him, Musa. This is the same spirit that came upon Moses. So you are that prophet who is foretold in the scripture because this particular incident is foretold in the scripture. So that's your first uh, uh, answer. And the second is, uh, these are the passages where you can see uh, Jesus is telling of someone coming in the future with certain qualities. And the qualities are what? Um, he, uh, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, just like Deuteronomy 18.18 18, as it states that this person will not speak of himself, rather he will speak from what he receives from God. Right? The Quran tells us directly, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Muhammad does not speak from his desires, rather he tells people what he receives from God. Revelation. Right? He will not speak from his, but he, uh, but, but whatsoever he shall hear, shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. In other words, he will make prophecies which Prophet Muhammad did and they have come to pass. He shall glorif glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show, uh, show unto you. So he will glorify Jesus Christ. Why would an Arab man, an Ishmaelite, a direct descendant of Ishmael through Kedar, mentioned in Isaiah 42 clearly that something is happening in the region of Kedar. Why specifically Kedar? The villages of Kedar. Why not the villages of Amazon, uh, China, Mongolia? Uh, and some, somewhere in Siberia or somewhere in Southern Africa or even Aboriginal Australia at that time, uh, you know, when uh, I'm sure there were people in Australia at that time, you know, in uh, the 7th century or before that. Why not them? Why Kedar in particular, one people, one specific people? Because Prophet Muhammad was to come from them, direct descendant of Kedar, number 60 from Kedar, according to his own genealogies. My time is up. Almost, right? I'll take that few seconds very quickly. So this is the answer to your question that that paraclete foretold uh, was not Jesus. And the, the term prophet, by the way, uh, Jesus is a prophet. He's not the prophet. You have to note that. Whenever Jesus, Jesus is mentioned in the New Testament as a prophet, he's mentioned a prophet. Jesus a, is a prophet. He's not the prophet. I mentioned the prophet, referring to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. That prophet was the prophet because the Israelites had had many prophets. But they are talking about the prophet. Who is the prophet? The prophet is the one who will come with the law uh, as foretold in the Bible. Thank you. Uh, so Samuel, you said that the counselor is the Holy Spirit, if I'm not mistaken. But then how do you reconcile this with uh, John 16, 13, when it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you un into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority. So how can the, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, not speak of his own authority? Um, sure. Well, well my, my point was that, my point with, with that was, Jesus clearly identifies the, the counselor as the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's, 
the first of these three steps to the answer. Jesus identifies the, uh, the Spirit as the... Let me just get this here. Uh, he speaks about the Holy Spirit as like, the counsellor. Um, I'm not going to find this, am I? Here we go. No, there it is. Uh, and so he speaks that uh, the Holy Spirit is the counsellor. And then what I showed was that the way the Holy Spirit is described in the Quran is basically the same as how it's described in John chapter 14. And so I'm saying that if we let the Quran tell us who Jesus is speaking about, that at basically every single point, it lines up with the Holy Spirit in the Quran. And so you could not go from the Quran and say, Jesus, uh, from the Quran, Jesus is speaking about Muhammad. If you go from the Quran, you'll say, Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit. The Quran has the Holy Spirit. The Bible has the Holy Spirit. They're described in pretty well the same way. That's what Jesus is speaking about. Now, the Spirit of God, uh, I see what the question is saying. It's saying if the Spirit is, is God, how can he not be speaking of his own authority? How come he doesn't speak of his own authority? Well, I, I think that's just the way that God reveals himself. He reveals himself through his Spirit. And so there is this, uh, there is this origin of the revelation coming from God, and he reveals it through his Spirit to us. And the Spirit is spoken of as the breath of God, meaning that he's not created, right? When the Spirit is the breath of God, it means he's not created. Uh, he's actually part of the very nature of God. He's of the same nature as God. And so this is how we understand uh, the, the Spirit, that he's described not as being created, but as being of the same nature as God. And he has a role of being uh, the revealer and the inspirer of the prophets. And he brings that revelation uh, from God to us. Thank you. Uh, what's the significance of winning or losing this argument in the greater context uh, of the future of humanity? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, the significance of this dialogue today is paramount for both communities. For those who are believing in a false prophet, they need to abandon their belief in a false prophet. They cannot believe in a false prophet. For those who believe in a true prophet of God must continue to believe in that true prophet of God because that's where the success is. Because the creator of the heavens and the earth who has revealed himself or his teachings in scriptures at different times and different places, he did that for the purpose of your guidance, for your betterment, for your well-being in this life and in the hereafter. When you follow his teachings and his laws coming from true prophets of God, you will prosper here and in the hereafter. And if you end up following false prophets, uh, then you are unfortunately doomed here and then in the hereafter. You need to use your intelligence, listen to us carefully. Uh, it's not about winning or losing. It's about guidance. It's about sympathy. It's about compassion and generosity. This is exactly why we are here. I am here to put the word of uh, the prophets in front of you. It's not, I'm, not going, I'm not even going to say I'm here to preach Islam to you. Okay, because we believe Islam is the religion of all prophets. Islam means submission to God's will. This is what it means, and this is what Christians seek to do, right? By that virtue, Christians are also Muslims, right? And looking at the other side of the coin, we are also Christians. We, the Muslims, as Christians, if being Christian means being compassionate, kind, for a follower of Jesus Christ, a follower, a follower of true teachings of Jesus Christ, then we, the Muslims, are the first Christians. We are the first Christians in the world. We believe in the Messiah. We follow his true teachings. Other teachings attributed to him uh, via false preachers and prophets, we will not follow them. Jesus was not God. He did not preach a trinity. He was not a trinitarian. We're not, we are not going to accept that because that goes against all the teachings of the previous prophets. Having said that, the issue uh, Samuel raised about the Holy Spirit in the Quran and the Bible uh, the Holy Spirit in the Quran is Angel Gabriel. It's very, very clear. Ruhul Qudus in the Quran is Angel Gabriel. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is an unknown entity. This person or this entity was so unknown that for as late as the third century, Christian scholars were still debating as to what the Holy Spirit is. We don't know. Origin, one of the most learned men in the third century, a church father, writes in the third century, as for the Holy Spirit, we have no idea what it is. We still have to look into the scripture carefully to see what the Holy Spirit is. This is the third century, 250 years after Jesus Christ, 
one of the most learned men in Christian history, the teacher of a man called Pamphilus, uh, and Pamphilus was a teacher of Eusebius, the father of church history. This is the origin I'm talking about. He said, we don't know. And sorry about that. I tend to go on. Uh, for, thank you so much. Uh, before I ask Sam this next question, I would just like to tell the audience to not go off topic because some of the questions I'm getting are very strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so this person is asking, you mentioned the, in the beginning that Muhammad did, وسلم, did not refer to God as uh, Yahweh and therefore cannot be a believer like the rest before him. Isn't that a two-edged knife putting all modern day Christians to question when they use so many names other than Yahweh. Um, well, well for, my point there is that the scripture in Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 says the prophet must speak in the name of Yahweh. That's what Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 says: must speak in the name of Yahweh. And my first point was that uh, Muhammad did not use that name, and the name in the Bible is important. It, you read the Old Testament, it's mentioned, I think, 6,000 times the name Yahweh and that the name of Yahweh will be known around the world. Now, the reason why, we're, why we today are speaking about the name of Yahweh is because of Jesus. Uh, Christians always use this name Yahweh. We've got posters about it. We've got little things you put around your wrist about Yahweh. We, we read about Yahweh in the scriptures all the time. And so I don't think it's a double-edged sword for Christians because Jesus gave us that name for God and we do say, you know, God is, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the Almighty, and we've got El Shaddai. There's a whole range of other names, but they're sort of, act, they're sort of attributes of what he does. His actual personal, personal name is Yahweh, and the fact that Muhammad doesn't know that name is significant because Deuteronomy 18.18 18 says they've got to use that name, and if you're not using that name, why not? And that's, that's all I'm saying. Uh, let me uh, echo those thoughts. We, want, we mainly want to talk questions on the topic that we're uh, discussing tonight. Um, so uh, the question I wanted to ask uh, out of the ones that I've received is, could you please address uh, Samuel's uh, interpretation or misinterpretation about the message of uh, the prophets in the Bible aligning with uh, either sort of Paul's teaching or Muhammad's teaching? Thank you for that, that question. Uh, first, let me respond to that question. Uh, Samuel's uh, deduction of prophetic uh, messages in the Bible. If you remember, Samuel put up um, a chart he put up a chart, a table, to show you the main teachings of the Bible which Muhammad disagreed with. And if you looked at the chart carefully, majority of the teachings there are from Paul. They're not even from biblical prophets who ran into thousands of people. And we have many of their writings, not all of them of course, not all the biblical prophets, uh, the teachings cannot be found in the Old Testament, but many are still there, right? Um, and Samuel comes up with a chart, and majority, the majority of the chart is from Paul, from the teachings of Paul directly. And this is the problem we have with the Christian view of Jesus Christ. When the Christians look at Jesus today, they look at him through the lens of Paul. They do not look at Jesus Christ from the lens of the Old Testament. That's why they ended up with a divine figure called Jesus, the God-man for example, or Jesus, the God-man who died on the cross for the sins of humanity, okay, and many other things. So, for that reason, he's absolutely right, Samuel is absolutely right that Muhammad did not teach those things. I agree with him 100%, because Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not break away from the biblical tradition as far as the Old Testament is concerned, and even Jesus Christ. So, did Muhammad use the word Yahweh? No, he did not. The question is now, ladies and gentlemen, prepare for the shock. Prepare, prepare for the shock. Did Jesus use the word Yahweh? 
Did Moses do, do, use the word Yahweh? No. Moses, I thought that was coming. <laughs> I was getting a bit passionate. So Moses did not speak the Hebrew language. Yahweh, if we were to go back to the language of the Bible, the, the, the earliest form we have is the Hebrew language, which is the language of Israelites. Moses did not speak that language. We have no idea as to what language Moses spoke. He may have spoken an early version of this language. The current biblical text is at least 1,000 years apart from Moses. The oldest manuscripts we have are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they date back to the 1st century BC. Moses lived somewhere in the 12th, 13th, 14th century BC. Right? What language did Moses speak? What language did Jesus speak? What word did he use for God Almighty as a personal name? You will never know. So this argument doesn't work. In fact, Jesus on the cross, if he was on the cross, he used the word Ilahi, Ilahi lama sabachthani. Ilahi is the same word which comes uh, from the root word Ilaha. Allah, Ilaha, Ilahi, Elohim, they all come from the same word and these are all biblical words by the way. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next question, um, this person feels that you're suffering from the Tekwekwe fallacy, known as the argument from hypocrisy, because when Adnan was um, attacking the Bible's integrity, saying it has been corrupted, you just threw back at him, but the Quran is corrupted too. So does this mean that you are acknowledging that the Bible has been corrupted and that there are different versions of it? Thank you, and, and that's a really good question. No, the reason I was so quick was I had to do it in that five-minute slot, and trying, trying to fit everything in a five minute slot is, is difficult. No, the Bible's, uh, the way that we know the Bible hasn't been changed is threefold. We have ancient copies of it going back uh, to the early centuries of Christianity. And as Adnan pointed out, to the Dead Sea Scrolls for the Old Testament before Christianity. And from those manuscripts, we can see it hasn't been rewritten. It just hasn't. Uh, We've then got translations that were made very early. There's the early Greek translation of the Old Testament, and then there's translations of the New Testament into different languages. And they, again, testify to what the text was like. And so we can look at those, and that's what scholars do. And again, they show it hasn't been rewritten. And then finally, we've got quotes that the early Christian scholars used when they were quoting the Bible to write their commentaries, and that testifies as well. So we've got a whole range of textual evidence that we use. Now, there are small differences amongst the manuscripts, as there are amongst the Quran manuscripts. I've got a leaflet up the back. You can have a look. It's all documented in the... Uh, for Christians, there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. For Muslims, it was the Sana manuscripts. And there's textual variance amongst them. I don't have a problem with that. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem when things are being written out and th that's just how it goes. But what we do, what our scholars do, is we look at them. Neither the Quran, neither the Bible have been rewritten. Their texts are sound and there's evidence to show that. Now, and so I, my, I wasn't being a hypocrite, I was answering as quickly as I could. And that's the line of evidence that we have for the Bible, those three things. And it shows that the Bible's been well preserved, as I believe the Quran is as well. I'm not saying that it's corrupted. But I'm saying, if we go around saying, uh, you know, one textual variant writes the whole thing off, uh, you can't do that because no book would stand up, including the Quran, under those circumstances. I'll finish there. Uh, this, will, this will be our last uh, question for tonight. I know that there's been uh, lots more that I've come in. Uh, we're sorry that we couldn't get to all of those, but obviously there's a limit. Uh, let me say, if you're free uh, Tuesday night, you should come to the other debate, uh, and then you can ask your question then. Uh, why is uh, this one relates to uh, expectation from the uh, from the uh, biblical texts? Uh, why is Muhammad the only person claimed to be a prophet uh, descended from Ishmael? All the prophets of the Old Testament uh, and Jesus are from Isaac's descendants, confirming God's special relationship with him. Uh, why does Muhammad come? after that. Thank you for that question. Uh, we don't claim that all prophets uh, in, or actually we don't accept that claim that all prophets in the Bible are Israelites. They're not. In fact, uh, the Jewish scholars will tell you, and the Christian scholars will tell you, that many 
Israelite prophets um, came, but there were others who were non-Israelites. Job, for example, okay, Jonah. Okay, these were non-Israelite prophets. And in fact, there are Ishmaelite prophets in the Bible as well. People who came from the descendants of Ishmael. But none of them were like Moses. That prophet who was being foretold in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, which the Jews were still awaiting when John the Baptist had come, when Jesus had come. So what questions did they ask? When they came to John the Baptist, they said, Are you one of these three? Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Mashiach? Are you Elijah or Elias? Are you that prophet or the prophet? They were not interested in a prophet. They were interested in that prophet. And John the Baptist denied all three um, uh, you know, possibilities. Jesus was the Christ, as the New Testament clearly testifies. Therefore, he could not be that prophet because even Jesus was aware of that distinction. Never claimed to be that prophet like Moses. In fact, Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, Then think not that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, rather I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Anyone who teaches anything outside of this law, even on a point, will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. And later on, Paul comes and abolishes the entire law. Right? Uh, that's another question altogether. I don't want to indulge in that. Right? The point here is, Jesus followed the Mosaic law. He was a follower of Moses. Muhammad was not a follower of Moses. In fact, he came with a new law. And that's why it is important for us to remember that. And when it came to Samuel before me, what, what point was discussed uh, before? Um, yes, and amazingly, Samuel did not put that challenge to me. Have you noticed? Uh, and I believe Samuel will not put that challenge to me. My challenge, I repeat it again, that copy of the Bible on his table, please challenge me that show me any passages in that Bible that cannot be found in the ancient biblical manuscripts. And put the same challenge to me on the Quran. It's a consistent challenge, right? I'm being fair, right? I'm doing justice. And I will show you passages that are missing from the earliest manuscripts of the Bible in the Greek language of the New Testament they are in that Bible on the table. For example, the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 53, to chapter 8, verse 11, the entire parocope adultery, the story of the adulteress caught in the act. It is missing from all the earliest manuscripts of the Bible up to the 9th century. Who put them in? Who put these verses in? That is the question. Are they from God? Are they from John? If they're not from John, are they from God? All these questions are very important, but that's not the debate tonight, by the way. <laughs> Alrighty. We'll now have four minutes uh, for each speaker to present their concluding arguments. Okay, so I want to thank you for coming tonight. It may not have been easy for you, but I hope that uh, you have found it helpful. I hope that as Adnan and myself have spoken frankly to each other, but in a spirit of love, but in a spirit of seriousness too, because you can be loving and serious at the same time. And as believers in God, we want to be loving and serious at the same time. And so I, I want to uh, thank you for coming. I want to thank you, Adnan, for coming and uh, that we can have this uh, genuine dialogue. I will now just give a summary of, of what I said. Um, so my first point was that the you know, Quran says that Muhammad is foretold in the Torah and the gospel, which is with the Christians. And I said that I don't believe it is. Because my first point was that there's a story that goes through the Bible. And it's the story of redemptive history and how God is going to fulfill all his plans and purposes in the person of the Messiah. And so if Muhammad comes 600 years later and says, no, it's actually about me and I'm fulfilling it all, that just doesn't fit into the message of the, of the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. The illustration I gave to show you this was the same way that the Baha'i prophets don't fit into the message of the Quran. Those prophets who come after Islam, like the Baha'i prophets, they don't fit into the storyline of the Quran. So, but that's how it is with Muhammad in the Bible. He just doesn't fit into that story because they say the promises of God come to their fulfillment in Jesus. I then looked at a series of uh, verses 
uh, going through, and I can't really go through them now, what I'd encourage you to do is to, to, to look further into this yourself. Maybe to watch this debate again and to look at the slides and to, to look up the evidence that Adnan and I have put forward so that you can come to your own conclusion because it can be a bit bedazzling when you know, verses are being put up and you haven't had time to look at them. And it may be that if you want to take this further, you'll go back and listen and, uh, and I want to encourage you to, to look at what I said, look at the verses that I've put forward and to work that out yourself. Um, I, I want to defend the table that I've put up here and I've got it there. Uh, Adnan was saying that this is the result of Paul, but I can assure you Moses taught that we're created in the image of God. That's chapter one, chapter one of, of the law of Moses. Uh, God created us in his image. The fatherhood and the son of God, that's in Moses. That's in the book of Exodus, where Israel is called the, the son of God. God comes to dwell with his people. That's in the law of Moses. That's not an idea from Paul. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but they, they're not from Paul. I've, we can look up all of those. That table actually is a representation of what the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms uh, teach. And just to conclude, I'm more than happy to, to debate any of those issues. Uh, you're saying, you know, you've said things and I, I, you weren't able to respond. Unfortunately, that's the nature of a debate, that you can say something and I can't respond and vice versa. That's how debates go. And, and God willing, we could um, maybe take up some of these in future events. But thank you again for coming tonight. Um, again, as I said, we need to take the things of God seriously. And I hope that tonight has helped you. And, uh, and God bless you. Good night. Thank you, Sam. We'll now have Adnan for his concluding statement. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to thank Samuel Green again for uh, participating in this debate. I would like to thank you all for your kindness, for your generosity, for your encouragement, for your attendance. Uh, may God bless you all. And anything we might have said tonight is not intended uh, uh, to hurt you or to insult anyone's faith or anyone's views rather this was an exercise to share our sympathy and love with each other I am very sure Samuel has sympathy and love for the Muslims and vice versa I have a lot of sympathy love compassion and generosity for to add some extra words for Christians um, uh, for, for my Christians uh, my Christian brothers and sisters in humanity so the purpose of this exercise was to primarily show that the Muslims and the Christians can, as civilized people, come together, share the ideas openly. Okay, and this can be done in the Muslim world as well, by the way. Um, uh, contrary to what a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate, uh, deceptive Christian missionaries tell you, that there is no freedom in the Muslim world. There is a lot of freedom. I have debated uh, Christians and atheists in Pakistan, right? So this can be done, and this is to be cherished. We must continue with this tradition of sharing our love and compassion with each other. And even if we don't agree with each other, we can go home, or go home um, thinking about what we have uh, said in these discussions and de these dialogues and come up with our own conclusions. So coming back to some of the points uh, Samuel uh, raised, but I don't think I'm gonna cover them because now time for rebuttal is over. It is now about reaching out to you to go into this topic in more detail and study it as Samuel rightly pointed out, that it is not possible for us to indulge in these discussions uh, extensively um, because this is a very, very short period for us to cover a lot of content. It is not possible for us to put everything in front of you. There are many, many powerful evidences on the Muslim side when it comes to the prophecy about Prophet Muhammad in the Bible. Baha'i faith, for example, or the, the Ahmadis who, claim, uh, who claimed another prophet after Islam, the reason why we don't take them seriously is because there's nothing about them, nothing close to what we find in the Bible about an Arabian prophet. In the Bible, we have clear verses talking about an Arabian prophet, an Ar Arabian savior, someone who will spread judgment on the earth, someone who will put idol worshippers to shame, someone who will triumph against his enemies. He will have something to do with the children of Kedar. He will come from Sela, where the mountain of Sela is. Sela is Medina, the city of the prophet of Islam, right? A prophet like Moses, the paraclete. There are so many verses in the Bible, okay? Arabia, 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 again and again. Why do we have all these references to Arabia specifically in the Bible? 
That's why we insist that they are talking about an Arabian prophet. I am co-authoring a book with two other uh, researchers, and the book is titled Abraham Fulfilled. Uh, this book is actually on this very topic. It might be the best research out there on the topic. I'm not trying to be arrogant here because I've read a lot of books uh, on this topic. And we have collected a lot of useful information for Christians as well as Muslims. So watch out for this book. It may take a while for it to come out. Keep following our social media accounts and you will see the book come out. Abraham Fulfilled, right? Uh, three people are authoring it currently as we speak. And the book is very, very powerful. A lot more evidence and detail can be found in that book. So I would like to thank you all from the depth of my heart for being such an amazing audience. I am honored to be in Perth, in Australia, to speak to such honorable and great people. And I hope we can continue in this spirit for the coming years. And we do away with hate. We reject hate wherever it is, whether it's from Muslims, whether it's Islamophobia, or whether it's Christian phobia. Whatever it may be, wherever it is, we have to reject it collectively. Thank you so much for listening. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the uh, end of the debate tonight. So let's please uh, clap these two gentlemen again.